Hey guys, Tom Moran here from Tom's Big Spiders, about to do kind of a genus review for Brachy Pelma. I've been getting a lot of questions about Brachys lately. I think uh, with winter coming and some of these Black Friday sales, people are picking up a lot of Brachys, which is great because I think sometimes they're overlooked for some of the old world species. I know when I first got into the hobby, I started with the beginner species, and then those were for a little while too tame for me as I moved on to the old worlds, but now I'm circling back and picking up a lot of these guys. Um, one in particular that I'm kind of uh, excited to cover is Brachy Pelma Bamey or Bomey, whatever way, or Boimey, whichever way you want to pronounce it. I'm sure there'll be a million different scientific pronunciations for it but I've had a lot of people ask about this particular species and I keep going to make a care video on it and I forget so here we go this one's going to be included as well so we'll go through some of the notes that I have on them and some of the basic care I'll give you a hint it's rather easy these guys are pretty much bulletproof and talk about the temperaments a little bit because some make better beginners than others so enough of me talking let's get on to the actual spiders all right, up first, we have one of the most popular pet tarantulas on the market and one that I have as my top beginner species. If there is such a thing, these are usually the ones I recommend, Brachypelma alba pelosum. Now, this one here would be considered a hobby form because it was one of the older specimens brought in years ago or bred years ago. Basically, what happened is when they were originally brought in, they were taken from Honduras and then possibly Costa Rica, sold in pet shops and called the Honduran curly hairs. Later, about 2010, 2011, I believe, we started getting the Nicaraguan varieties, and many folks started calling the Nicaraguans pure, referring to the ones that had been coming in before as possible hybrids. Now, the thought process is that some of the ones that have been in the hobby for a while could have been hybridized with other ones or not pure bloodlines from Honduras. Nobody's for certain until we start doing DNA testing. We're not going to know. I know I have one that's probably hybridized with the Voggins. That happens quite a bit. However, it has been noted in the wild. Several of these, the Honduran ones, have shown different physical characteristics, even purebred ones in the wild. So there's no way to really tell by looking at them. But a lot of people have been labeling ones that they owned before 2011 or ones that they know are not Nicaraguan as hobby form, meaning we're not quite sure what they are. Are they all hybrids? Absolutely not. But it's important that if you're not sure to kind of label your species as such so that we don't pollute bloodlines any more than we possibly already have. But this is an amazing spider here. This one here is supposedly a Nicaraguan. It's looking a little light, but again, you can't always go by the appearance of color. We'll see what happens when it matures, but it was purchased as a Nicaraguan species. I do want to own a Nicaraguan because I've had some, well, it was actually basically only one person tell me that they could be much more high strung. After speaking to some people, a buddy of mine explained that the ones that are wild caught can be quite defensive, but that's pretty much true with any species of tarantula that's pulled out of the wild. A lot of times once they are bred in captivity for a while, their temperaments calm down quite a bit. But a wonderful species, again, a great beginner species. Fuzzy little guys. They're just When you see one with the full hair, set of hair and the long curly hairs, it's just absolutely amazing to look at, and you can understand why they're so popular in the hobby. And the growth rate on these guys, depending on the temperature, this is a species that can do well at room temperature, but if you keep them warmer in the 80s, you'll get much faster growth rate. And here we have my Brachypelma classy or Mexican pink beauty. I picked this one up, I believe, about three and a half years ago, and she's finally showing her adult colors. And I'll tell you, I absolutely love the look of the spider, and I've seen pictures of the adults. They are glorious when they're full grown, just a very unique spider. And again, I think a lot of folks ignore Brachypelma. What happens is we get into the hobby, we go for the quote unquote beginner species, then we start getting some experience under our belt, and we kind of put them away. They're like the vanilla ice cream. Like, why are we going to do these plain ones when we've got all these feisty old worlds out there? And then we ignore them for a while. And I kind of did the same thing, but I've been circling back, picking up a lot of these guys in the last few years. This one's been a wonderful spider. When it was a sling, it did burrow. I kept it in the typical vial. It was a smaller dram vial, and it burrowed. Would pop up, eat food, go back and back in its burrow again. I kept the substrate, part of the substrate, moist at all times when it was a sling. And then as it put on some size and got to be about eh, two inches or so, I backed off. I will moisten a corner of this. This one right now here is probably close to three inches. I'm, I'm terrible with judging the size, but I'm guessing two and three quarters of three inches. And I will occasionally, you know, I keep the water dish full. I'll moisten down a corner, but it hasn't shown any preference for the moist substrate. It also hasn't done any burrowing and generally sits right out in the open, which is great because I love looking at it. And as you can see here, this one is just molted, not I believe two days before this video was shot, and it has picked up its adult colorations. They can take a long time to grow. So know that if you pick up one of these guys, one of the downsides to the Brockies 
is they are such slow growers, is particularly when they're super tiny, like a third of an inch. It can take them a long time to start looking like big beefy slings. However, usually after they hit the inch mark, the growth rate and the size they gain with each molt seems to increase, which is good. So for people looking to buy these species, you may be on the lookout for one of the larger ones. And here we have Lazarus, my Brachypelma baimi, probably hybridized with a Brachypelma baumgartni. Basically, these are two very similar looking species. The baumgartni tend to be less vibrant. The baimi or boimi or bomi, whatever way you want to pronounce it, tend to be a little more vibrant. I picked this one up several years back, and after reading a post on arachnivores about these, this species possibly being hybridized, realized that mine was basically probably the same age as the batch would have been that was released into the pet trade that they knew was hybridized. Basically, two people or a couple people bred these guys. It was a, a Bamey or Boimey and a Baumgartney produced offspring and sold them into the pet trade as the purebreds, which is terrible. But anyway, I had a gentleman who seemed to know what he was talking about that knew how to tell the difference between the two, and I did notice some differences with the vibrancy and the amount of black on the carapace, and I asked him to look at pictures, and he said pretty sure, he was pretty certain this was one of the hybrids. So unfortunately, this young lady will not get bred. People ask why they don't naturally hybridize. Um, I believe these two species in the wild are separated by some physical I think it's a river. I will put in the comments, I will double check because I have notes somewhere that separates the two species that keeps them from interbreeding. So it doesn't happen in the wild unless somebody floats over and, and mates with somebody else. And here is the purebred one that I picked up as a sling. Now I have found that babies do prefer a little moist substrate when they're smaller. This one was kept in a vial and basically burrowed the entire time. I then moved him to a six out or her to a 16 ounce deli cup and again kept part of the moist, uh, substrate moist at all times they grow a little bit faster in my opinion these are all kept around you know the 70s range than some of the other brachypelma this one is probably a good half an inch bigger than the closy i showed earlier and i've got them both at the same size they were both about a third of an inch and obviously you're seeing some of those adult colors come in stunning species overall just really they, they get those fluffy legs with the orangey red color on it. I, again, I love those colorations of the brackies, especially the colorful ones. And you'll see here that this one is in pre-molt, starting to darken up and give that bruised look to the abdomen. She'll hopefully be molting soon and have even more of those adult colorations. But very easy to keep. I have found that once they get a little older, they don't seem to want moist substrate at all. They will prefer dry. My other one is in a large Exoterra breeding container and does just fine in that. And here we have the hobby staple, Brachypelma hammeri. People have been asking me what the differences are between the hammeri and the smithy. And basically, it comes down to some markings on the patella and vibrancy. Uh, the true B, the B smithy, the one that is actually the real B smithy, not the one that was sold as B smithy for quite some time, tends to be much more vibrant. The orange on the knees tends to carry down into the next leg segment. You can see this one here, although beautiful and quite bright, actually looks a bit washed out if you see pictures or photos of a true Brachypelma smithy, but it really doesn't matter because if you don't have pictures to compare them to, you'd never even know they're still beautiful spiders, but very easy to keep. Again, this girl is a terribly slow grower. One of the few spiders I picked up as a sexed uh, juvenile, she was about two and a half to three inches or so. That was probably about five years ago now. And as you can see, she's put on some decent size, just molted again, but she's still around four and a half inches maybe. So they take a long time to grow. I also have a sling that is probably right around the three quarter inch mark now, maybe an inch that I've had for several years. So once again, as teeny tiny slings, they take a while to put on size, but once they get larger, they tend to put it on a little more quickly. But this one was a little bit skittish, and keep in mind, they can be skittish when they're younger and juveniles. I've had a lot of people tell me that their B. smithies will bolt around the tanks and kick hairs, and she was kind of the same way. It was a, not so much the hair kicking, but a lot of bolting around. So although they have a reputation for a very calm temperament, be aware that smaller specimens are going to act a little bit more skittish when big hands come floating over top of them to drop food or do cleaning, so you may get some of that skittish defensive behavior. But you can see here, she's pretty laid back. I had the camera on. She just wants the darn camera out of her eyes. 
And here, I never liked to do this, but she was completely out in the open and then disappeared for me for two days, so I couldn't get a shot of her. But this is my Brachypelma auratum. I absolutely adore the look of this species. She's showing her adult colorations. Again, another super slow grower. We call this one autumn because she reminds me of autumn leaves or Halloween, just the look of her. But finally, I think the next moat will probably bring a deeper black and some more vibrant oranges on the knees. But a stunning specimen, slow grower, but again, with the slow growth comes a spider that you're going to have for years to come. These guys are thought to live 30 to even 40 years. And before somebody comes on and says that's not true, that is absolutely not an exaggeration anyway. We're not sure how long they live because we haven't really been keeping these spiders for all that long. There's possible people that got these things in the 80s as slings that still have them around. We don't know how long they live for. But you can see very beautiful spider. Very easy to care for as a sling. I kept some moist substrate in the bottom layers, some dry on the top. She was in originally a little pill bottle or a dram bottle. And then as she grew, we moved her into a 16 ounce deli cup and then into one of these, I believe, mainstay or something. It's one of these ones I get off of Amazon, crystal clear, hinge top, perfect for a little juvenile size. She's been doing great. And the good thing is they stopped the burrowing after about an inch and eh, maybe an inch and a half or so. She started coming out more. And then once she hit about the two inch mark, she's out in the open quite a bit, except for, of course, today when I was trying to get footage of her. And up next, we have Brachypelma Voggins. These guys are a beautiful spider. Look at the black legs there and that red seta on the abdomen. Just an amazing looking animal. This is one of the faster growing Brachypelma species in my estimation. I got this one as a three inch sex female. She's about six inches now. It didn't take her all that long to reach that size. She would eat like a machine grow rather quickly and put on a decent amount of size with each molt. Now, this is one of the species that people often talk about as a beginner species, and I do think they can be good beginners as long as people are aware that they are a little bit more high strung and a little quicker than most of the Brachys on the market. So just be aware of that, but I think as far as a beautiful spider and an active spider, you can't do much better than one of these guys as a starter tarantula. Now, I have this one here. I have another one I bought that was mislabeled that is also probably a Brachypelma Voggins, but could be some type of hybrid, and we're trying to figure it out. But just an amazing spider overall. Now, my girl did quite a bit of burrowing, even at three inches. She had an elaborate burrow in her enclosure. So this is one that as you know, slings and juveniles, you want to give them a bit of substrate to bury in. House, the house she had before this one actually offered several inches of substrate, but she started hanging out right in the open. The only time she disappears into that burrow there, and it's a very shallow one, is when she's going to molt. So she's out in the open quite a bit, eating machine, beautiful spider. And this is one of the species of brachys that seems to appreciate a little moisture, especially when they're smaller slings and juveniles. So I did keep it moist for her until she put on quite a bit of size. It looks dry in there now, but right after this video was shot, I added some moisture, made it rain on one end to give her a moist end. Again, they're very adaptable and seem to do well on moist or dry substrate. You'll talk to people that keep them both ways. I like to give mine a choice. And fun fact, these guys are actually found in Florida now. They were not endemic to Florida. They were brought in, but there are now established pockets of populations in parts of Florida, which is pretty cool. Now, husbandry for these guys is almost identical for the teeny tiny slings, like a third of an inch. You're going to want to be able to see them. So a dram bottle or a two ounce souffle cup will probably be your best bet to start off. You're going to give them some moist substrate as slings. I know there's some confusion there because a lot of these guys do well dry, but as slings, you want to give them the opportunity to have that moisture and give them the opportunity to burrow. And most of these guys will burrow as slings, so don't be surprised if they eat and disappear on you. I also start the teeny tiny ones on pre-killed. I don't mess with flightless fruit flies, but you could use those if you prefer. There's nothing wrong with them. But I find pre-killed works just as well and fattens up pretty quickly, and then they disappear and go into pre-molt. The growth rate is very, very slow, so they're going to be in these enclosures for quite some time. Once they put on a little size, maybe hit an inch or so, then it's off to the 16 ounce deli cup or something around that size. Again, I do keep part of the substrate moist at all time, even at that size, because I found that it does encourage the burrowing and they do seem to prefer it. Now, once they hit juvenile size, you know, two inches or so, I found that medium critter keepers or small critter keepers work well, as do Exoterra. Breeding boxes, either the small or mediums, are perfect size for them. I, I particularly like the small. They give them enough space to move around, but they aren't too overwhelmingly large. They hold enough substrate for them. Usually at this point, they'll stop the burrowing and use a den. So you want to include, obviously, your cork bark and definitely water dishes. 
once they hit around the three and a half, four inch mark around there, that's when I start looking at adult enclosures. Uh, I've used the Exoterra breeding box larges for some of them. I like the fact they offer a lot of floor space, enough room for substrate and hide, but not a lot of room to climb. Five to 10 gallon aquariums work fine, but you got to make sure you put enough substrate in there because they will climb and a fall from too high could rupture an abdomen. Jamie's enclosures are perfect for these guys. Perfect size, well ventilated, look very, very pretty. Or Sterlite boxes, I will put the size up here in the notes section, can work great. They offer enough room for substrate, enough land room for them to move around, or floor space for them to move around, and they're easily ventilated and stackable for people to have larger collections that aren't worried so much about presenting them in a pretty manner. Those work perfectly great. So any of those would work fine. And again, you include the normal amenities, a cork bark hide, because they may use that when they get startled or when they molt. A water dish is important, and they're not going to do, these species are not going to do a particularly much webbing. They're not going to web a lot. So you don't really have to worry about decorating in terms of web anchoring. It's not going to make a difference. But if you want to throw fake foliage in there, definitely by all means go for it. Have some fun. Create a nice little enclosure for them. As far as temperatures are concerned, they do well at room temp, so that means high 60s into the 70s. Do note that in particular, the B. Voggins and the B. albopelosum will both grow much faster if kept warmer. I've kept my guys in the 70s and I get medium growth rates, but I've spoken to a couple folks that keep theirs in the 80s because it's warmer where they live and they tend to grow much quicker. We're talking about one person had a B. albopelosum reach three inches in a year. Mine was about an inch or so. So do note that the warmer you keep them, the faster they'll grow, but it really doesn't matter. It doesn't hurt them if you keep them a little cooler. Now, feeding-wise, slings, I usually try to feed twice a week. If you feed them larger prey items or pre-killed items, no, they may only eat once or twice and then go into pre-molt. For adults, the majority of these guys do well on two or three crickets a month. They don't eat a whole heck of a lot, or I'll feed them, you know, bi-weekly works, weekly works, but you don't have to overfeed them. So if you're feeding large dubia, know that they're not going to need to eat as often. If you're feeding crickets, I've talked to folks that feed them four in one sitting once a month. You can feed them a cricket once a week. You can feed them a couple crickets once a week. Just don't overdo it. This isn't a species like a Formictopus or a Therophosa where you need to drop in 20 crickets. That's overkill. A few crickets here and there works fine. There's no real science to how much you feed them. Just know that if you feed them a lot in one sitting and you feed them more often, chances are they will go off feed much quicker and have a longer pre molt period. So you'll have a spider that's not eating, which tends to worry some people. And the two exceptions to this one would probably be the B. Voggins and B. albopelosum. My B. albopelosums are eating machines and will generally eat until they look like they're ready to pop. I have a female that is about the size of a golf ball in her abdomen. It might be a slight exaggeration, but her abdomen is quite plump. And I figured she'd be off feed, but I dropped in a cricket the other day and she ate it. And my Voggins tend to be a bit more active and they're faster growing, so they seem to eat a bit more. And that seems to be the general rule of thumb with any tarantulas. The ones that are fast growing, you can feed more and more often. The ones that are slower growing, you don't need to feed as often. So for example, my bee hammer eye, not one that's really going to eat a whole heck of a lot. I drop in a few crickets, she eats, sometimes she'll just eat one and bat the others away. Unlike my Voggins, it will grab all three of them up. And my Brachypelma bomies or bamies tend to be really good hunters, but again, you don't want to overfeed them because I had my big female that I was feeding quite a bit and she went off feed for several months and went into a very long pre-mold. So again, they're good hunters, but they don't need to be overfed. All right, welcome back. Hopefully you enjoyed that and you appreciate it. I do have some gaps I have to fill, obviously, in my collection. I get a lot of questions about whether or not I can do a care video on uh, Brachypelma amelia. And unfortunately, I don't have one yet, but I'm on the lookout for one. I would like to fill basically all my gaps. I'm kind of doing some shopping now, looking for some other species to get. So obviously, as I pick those up, I'll do some updates on them. But for the most part, you keep them almost identical as far as care is concerned. Again, they are very hardy spiders, which is one of the reasons why they make good beginners spiders. Some of them are more docile than others. Again, the Bamie and Erotum right now are some of my more skittish tarantulas, but my Smithy is very laid back, as is my Voggins, although Voggins can also be very skittish as well. So again, it all depends on the temperament of the individual spider. So that'll do it for this one. Again, if this is the first video of mine you've caught, thanks so much for watching. If you want to check out a couple more, I usually put them around in here. And if you liked it enough that you'd like to subscribe, very much appreciated. You can go ahead and click the little circle that's going to be right around in here. As always, love hearing from you guys. I try to stay up with the comments, although I've gotten a little behind on them lately. So hopefully I'll see some of you guys on the comment section.